All right, folks. So thanks for joining us again for, uh, for the CSRD training with, and uh, today talking about building construction. So basically with building, uh, we're going to start by talking about different types of burn, uh, building material. Um, and understanding about building construction is, is vitally important. We need to understand how uh, structures are built uh, so that we can understand how to fight fires inside of these structures when they do occur. And uh, the first part of building construction to understand is, is building materials. Sorry about that. So building materials, we have a, a huge variety that's used in construction. All of these materials will, will react differently when they're exposed to the heat of, of a fire. Uh, knowledge of the way that they react will give us an idea of what to expect from a fire in that type of construction. So understanding the, the different types of building material and, and their properties to determine when it's safe to enter a building and when we may need to evacuate. All right, so the first and most common material that, uh, for building is wood. This is the main component in a variety of different types of structural assemblies. Um, the size of the wood, the moisture content of the wood, that's going to affect how it reacts in a fire situation. When you have smaller dimensions of lumber, you're looking at something that's going to be easier to ignite. It will lose structural integrity faster. Um, sometimes though, if it's protected by like gypsum, drywall, some kind of other insulation, uh, it, it will have a little bit, it, it'll, it'll last a little bit longer. Um, the larger the beams, much more difficult to ignite. Uh, they'll retain their structural integrity even after prolonged exposure to direct flame. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the moisture content affects the burn rate. The higher the moisture, con the higher moisture content, we can, some people know that as green wood. Um, it, doesn't, it does not ignite readily and it does not burn as fast as kiln dried or, or uh, uh, dried wood. Uh, that's been exposed to air for a long period of time. Uh, sometimes the wood uh, that we use can be pressure treated uh, and sometimes it's with fire retardant chemicals that can reduce the ignition and the burn speeds. Uh, not always totally effective in reducing fire spread and uh, often weakens the load carrying capability as much as 25% by using these type of uh, fire retardant chemicals. Uh, with newer construction, uh, we often have composite building components and materials. Uh, we have, these composite materials are made of wood fibers, plastics, other substances joined together by glues or resin binders. Uh, it, uh, they include things like plywood, particle board, fiber board, um, or, or <laughs> Orient Stand Board, OSB. Um, under fire conditions, these can be very highly combustible. They can produce a significant amount of toxic gas and rapidly deteriorate. Uh, so this new change in building construction using these types of composite materials has certainly changed the fire landscape and we're going to learn more about that as we go on. So next one to talk about is masonry and with masonry we've got three different types here that we can talk about. Masonry includes brick, stone, concrete, block. Um, basically when you're looking at mason uh, masonry it's inherently fire resistive. Uh, it's a poor conductor of electricity uh, and, but it can act as a heat reservoir. So it's going to maintain the heat in that building. It's going to suck in heat and it's going to be, be releasing it back into the building. Um, with prolonged exposure to a fire, masonry can also collapse. Uh, brick uh, and stone are used to create veneer walls in some cases. So they're not actually load bearing in any ways. They're basically created on the outside, uh, uh, on the exterior, and it's more for the look, right? Um, decorative covers made for wood, it can be made for, you know, to go over top of wood, metal, uh, or even concrete block may have another type of masonry on the outside um, of those for the load bearing walls. Um, masonry is typically minimally uh, affected by fire and exposure to high temperatures. Um, but some of the signs of, but we need to be aware of some of the signs of deterioration of masonry uh, when it is starting to lose its structural integrity. Um, bricks rarely show any kind of signs of loss of integrity, so or any kind of serious de deterioration. Uh, they will just collapse at one point. 
Um, stone and concrete, uh, they may lose small portions on the surface when, when they're heated. This is called spalling. It basically heats up, then there's moisture inside, will blow out and, and cause little, little pock marks in it from, uh, from the heat. Um, concrete blocks, they may crack. Uh, they usually still will retain their strength, though the concrete will, uh, and their structural sort of stability. Um, the mortar between the bricks we need to take into account as well. Um, the mortar can de degrade but with heat and just and start like turn up the noise. Yeah, of weakening. The next material we'll talk about is concrete. Uh, concrete is naturally fire resistive. It's a very poor conductor of heat. Um, it's used to insulate other materials in many cases. Uh, it's often used in, in uh, foundations, uh, columns, floors, walls, roofs, and exterior pavement, of course. Um, it's very, very, concrete is very strong under compression, so it doesn't, it, it will not compress, uh, but it will be weak under tension. So if we're trying to pull it, it's actually fairly, it's not very difficult to pull it apart. Um, and again, it can be damaged through exposure to fire and the spalling can, can result, uh, can result and that spalling can lead to a structural collapse. When we're, pull, when we're using concrete, uh, when the concrete is used as a building, uh, as a building material, oftentimes it's going to be reinforced concrete. So reinforced concrete, typically it's poured in place at the construction site or formed into precast sections and transported to the site. Uh, this concrete is internally forged, so it has uh, steel reinforcement bars, some people may know it as rebar um, or a wire mesh or something else to keep the concrete uh, together. Um, this will give the materials a compressive strength, ability to withstand a pressure on the surface. Um, it also gives tensile strength, the ability to withstand being pulled apart or stretched. So again, it increases the strength of the concrete by adding these either rebar or wire mesh uh, reinforcement. Um, under fire conditions, it, it, concrete performs well, but it can lose strength through spalling, like we talked about. Um, cracks and spalling indicate that damage has already occurred. Uh, the strength may be reduced, and it, it may, it's going to be reduced even before visual evidence of spalling has occurred. Uh, prolonged exposure to chemicals before exposure to the fire can, all, <clears throat> can cause the rebar to corrode and concrete bond to weaken. So uh, if, if the reinforcement within the concrete uh, is starting to deteriorate, that reduces the amount of time to the failure of the structure. Um, it's also very important <clears throat> to know the, the, the history of the occupancy when we're there, um, to know how long has this building been around, what is the likelihood that we're going to have deterioration of the uh, of the reinforced concrete. There we go. All right, <clears throat> next one to talk about <clears throat> is steel. Steel is the strongest material in common use in both compression and tension. Uh, Use its uses uh, primarily. Primarily, it's the it's the primary material used for structural support support in uh, of uh, large modern buildings, um, stairs, wall studs, windows and door frames, balconies, railings. All can be made out of steel. Um, oftentimes, when you're using steel in those ways, you'll have reinforced concrete floors, uh, possibly roofs and walls, uh, and the steel is actually what's reinforcing that concrete. Um, the, a big thing to remember when you're when we're talking about uh, steel, though, is that um, structure, structural members of steel and steel, when heated, will expand. And if it's a structural member, we're looking at structural members that will lengthen or elongate when they're heated. Um, so something like, uh, for an example, a 50 foot beam may elongate by as much as four inches. And that's quite a bit when you think about, you know, the, the, how big our buildings are and four inches pushing out on the side of a wall uh, can actually have devastating effects on that structure. Uh, so if, and that's uh, basically failure can be anticipated at temperatures at or uh, near or above a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. That's 538 degrees Celsius. The exact temperature is going to vary, uh, vary based on uh, a number of different variables. Uh, those include things like the size of the steel, uh, the steel beam, the load that it's under, the composition of the steel. So different steel, not all steel is equal. Different steel, you have high quality and lower quality, uh, and the geometry of the member. So the way that the, the, that it's been created and uh, and uh, the shape of it. 
the effective heat uh, is reduced when fire mater uh, fireproofing materials are used. Uh, things such as uh, sprayed on uh, uh, sprayed on concrete insulation, uh, those types of things will actually um, improve the fire improve the fireproofing and uh, give it a little bit longer. Um, but when we're firefighting, a couple of things we need to be aware of. So first thing, we need to be aware of the type of members used in a particular structure. Are we using steel beams? Is that, if that, and uh, understanding that's what we have, now we know that we have something that's going to expand when heated, and uh, we understand that that could cause building collapse. Uh, determine how long the members have been exposed to the heat. So how, like, when did we get the call? How long has this fire been burning? Um, that also gives us an indication on when failure may occur. Um, Remember that we have to remember as well, the critical temperature can be easily reached at the ceiling level from the rising heat and smoke. So the thermal layering, all the hot smoking gases rising, that's creating a much higher temperature where these, uh, where these steel supports are up at the ceiling level than we may be feeling down on the ground. Only way to know that uh, and, and what kind of temperatures they're dealing with would be with something like a thermal imaging camera. Uh, and we always have to consider the effect of heat on members, even if you can't see, even if you can't see it. We have to assume that something is that this is heat, that there's extreme heat going on on these steel beams, and we have to then plan accordingly for the possible and likely outcomes of that. So, like I mentioned, the elongating of that steel it pushes out, it can push out on the load-bearing walls, uh, and that will cause collapse. If the walls uh, can withstand the elongation, the steel will fail and sag somewhere in the middle. So the picture that I have on the right of your screen there, you'll see uh, that's, uh, those are steel members that have been exposed to fire. You can see the warping and the damage that was caused by them. The walls did not come, uh, did not come down. The walls were able to withstand the expanding of the steel, but the steel itself actually ended up bending and twisting. Um, water can cool the structural members and stop that elongation from happening. Um, however, of course, adding water to, to, to super hot steel can also cause it to be very brittle and can cause a problem of its own. Um, but it does, and typically reducing the temperature is the best way we have of reducing the risk for collapse. So hitting again with penciling into the thermal layer, cooling that area, cooling the beams, uh, that's the way we want to try and prevent structural collapse. So before I move on past steel, I also want to talk about a couple of other types of metals that might be used in construction, things like iron. <clears throat> um, so with iron, we have a couple of different types. We have, we have uh, cast iron and we have uh, wrought iron. Uh, cast iron, uh, it was very common in, you know, in the 19th century for structural supports, beams, columns, stairs, balconies, just about everything. Um, it stands up really well in fire. We don't use it as much today for those kinds of things, at, at hardly at all. Uh, it stands up really well to fire in intense heat, um, but iron and cast iron specifically uh, may crack or shatter when it's rapidly cooled with water. That's really important to understand. So if it is something that's, you know, that, that, that could be a collapse hazard, by cooling cast iron, we are, we are definitely increasing the likelihood that you're going to have uh, a crack or shatter on you. Um, and I don't know if any of you have cooked before or using those cast iron pans, but if you've ever used a cast iron pan, put it into, you know, it's gotten it red hot and then throw it into the, into the, the, into the sink, into water. I've actually cracked a pan doing that before. So it's, uh, it's no joke. It certainly happens. Um, failure can also result from the bolts rusting through. Uh, mortar can become loose around the bolt and that'll cause it to pull away from the building. Uh, the other type of iron, uh, like I mentioned, was wrought iron. Uh, wrought iron was used in buildings of the early 1800s, um, often used for nails, uh, tie rods, railings, balconies as well. Um, typically uh, after 1850 it was used for rail and I-beam channels, uh, support columns, um, used today typically for decorations and construction of gates and fences. So with cast iron, uh, typically they'll be bolted or screwed. Uh, the pieces will be bolted or screwed together with wrought iron. You're usually riveting or welding them together. Uh, another metal that, the, that, uh, that we'll see in construction at times may be aluminum. Uh, usually in things like decorative features, uh, the tower portion of the Empire State Building in New York is uh, made of aluminum. Um, Sometimes it's decorative and functional, roofing, flashing, gutters, downspouts, uh, window and door frames, exterior curtain uh, wall panels. Um, in resi in, uh, for residential use, uh, it can be used in places like sunrooms, uh, screened porches, carports, awnings. 
and uh, aluminum framing and, framing and support wires uh, support acoustical tile ceilings and they can create entanglement hazards. They will be affected, so aluminum will certainly be affected by heat more rapidly than steel. So other, again, a couple of other ones just to touch on quickly, tin, usually that can be used to produce metal ceiling tiles, also known as a roof covering. Um, copper, it's found in our wiring, our pipes, gutters, decorative elements, and then lead. Uh, lead could be found in older pipes, uh, flashing as a component of stained or leaded glass windows. All right. Gypsum, also known as drywall. Uh, how about, how about, um, I don't know if there's any buildings like this in the, like the straw houses, like where they straw with the, the concrete on the outside? Uh, yeah, there's, 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 there's all sorts of new age materials as well, and we couldn't cover all of them. Um, I personally have been to a, a fire in a house that had tires in the walls. Uh, I've been to, uh, you know, and uh, was using tires, uh, beer cans as insulation, um, and all different types. I, these, you know, so they, they build these houses to be environmentally friendly and using these kind of sustainable products, and that's great. Under fire conditions, though, we know how straw is going to, is going to react. It is going to burn very rapidly, very hot, even when compressed to the point where we're using it in, um, in, uh, in building and in building construction as load-bearing walls, right? So it'll have a good compression strength. It'll, it'll compress very nicely, um, but it's also going to have a very low uh, flash point and fire point and uh, it, will, it will be consumed very quickly under a fire. So there are all sorts of different types of, uh, of other um, kind of uh, non-conventional building materials out there. Thanks, Annette. So when we think of gypsum, again, drywall, gyp rock, sheet rock, that's, you know, we've, we've all seen it. We have it in our homes. We know what this stuff is. Um, but it's, it, it has a, typically a gyp rock, it has a, a pretty high water content inside of it. And what that does is it'll, absorb a great deal of the heat as that moisture evaporates, all right? So the gyp rock is actually taking the heat in as, that, as, as the moisture inside of that gyp rock is evaporating. It gives excellent heat resistant and fire retardant properties. It will, you know, delay fire progression within the structure. It will break down, however, gradually under fire conditions. Um, Commonly, we're using gyp uh, gypsum to uh, insulate steel and structural members. Um, when it failed, structural members behind will be then subjected to the high temperatures and they could end up failing. All right, lathe and plaster. <clears throat> um, basically, lathe and plaster is a process. It's not, it's not a material, it's a process. Um, it's two different <laughs> materials in the title. <clears throat> so the, the horizontal wood strips that you can see in the center there, uh, those are called lathe and they're nailed to wall studs. Uh, they're then covered with a mixture of plaster to form the, and that'll form the interior wall finish. A lot of the, uh, these are generally found in buildings uh, constructed prior to the 1950s. Uh, in some cases, uh, wire mesh may be used to replace the lathe in some of the houses. So you can see the photo on the right. Uh, where we have that wire mesh uh, in there as opposed to using the, uh, the wood strips. A uh, couple of things to take into account as firefighters, uh, lathe and plaster can be very difficult to penetrate with axes or hand tools. And uh, I, we have a couple of fire departments on today who can probably attest to that. Uh, trying to go in through a, a lathe and plaster uh, is, is incredibly difficult. And, and finding a drywall area is, uh, is often much easier. Uh, pulling off a siding, if there's a area you can go to, you, you should consider it. Um, the other thing with lathe and plaster is it can conceal fire within a cavity between the surfaces. So between where the lathe is over top of the studs, in between there, fire gets in there, it can start, it, the, the fire can then grow and move around uh, inside the structure. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. Uh, and then it also may add fuel to the fire in the form of the lathe and the studs that are used to form these kind of walls. With all that wood being in a wall, that's all fuel, all of that can burn and, uh, and can add to that fuel load inside the house. All right, glass and fiberglass. So again, glass not used for structural support typically. <laughs> um, 
the sheet form uh, of glass is used uh, primarily things like doors and windows. Um, the block form uh, that we have in the uh, top middle there, that can be used for non-load bearing walls. Um, sometimes you'll see wire reinforced uh, to provide some kind of thermal protection as well as a bit of a separation. Um, it's not, glass is not a real effective barrier to fire extension. Uh, glass will fail fairly quickly in many structure fires when exposed to heat. Uh, because the heat may crack and shatter it, uh, especially if uh, once that glass is struck by a cold fire stream, uh, you're very likely that, uh, that that glass is going to fail. Now fiberglass, um, th that's typically used for, uh, as an insulator. Uh, we'll find that in between interior and exterior walls and between ceilings and roofs. Uh, the glass component of fiberglass is not a significant fuel in any way. Uh, the materials used to bind it may be combustible uh, and very difficult to extinguish, however. So plastic. Plastic can be used in many forms. Uh, on the exterior, we know of things like vinyl siding, as in that center photo there. Um, it can be used in water and sewer pipes, the photo on the left. Um, decorative uses, it can be used on uh, for moldings, wall coverings, mantelpieces, lighting fixtures, um, foam plastic is used as an insulation, uh, rarely used as a structural support. Um, with plastic, as we know, and as we've probably seen when we've done our own campfires and been goofing around, most will, plastics are going to melt. Um, and that melting plastic can still contribute to the <clears throat> um, Many plastics will release a dense, really toxic smoke when they burn. So that when you see that it's a, it's a good indicator that uh, that that you've got so, that uh, you've got some plastics, possibly hydrocarbons, in there as well. All right, now we'll start talking a bit about composite materials. So these are starting to be used far more frequently than they were used in the past. Um, with a composite material, we're talking about something that's manufactured by combining two or more distinctly different materials. Um, and the result is a lightweight material, high structural strength um, and resistance to chemical wear, um, corrosion resistant, heat resistant in some cases. Uh, the materials are, are often also cost effective, easy to manufacture. Uh, some examples of composite materials uh, would be things like laminated timber, that's uh, another name for plywood, um, or glue, lam uh, glue laminated wood. Um, these are sheets of wood that are used primarily for roof and floor decking, walls, stair treads, things like that. Uh, medium density fiberboard, MDF. Uh, it's another type of laminated wood product. It's closer in appearance and strength to hardwood. Um, oftentimes used for things like doors and door surrounds, uh, decorative moldings, rails, skirtings, and cornices. Um, particle board. Particle board is what it sounds like. It's made from small particles and flakes genera uh, generated in the manufacture of lumber. Uh, so they take them, they basically then use uh, adhesives to glue the, the, all these particles together and make one uh, long sheet. Um, so uh, these, compose a very, uh, these compose a health hazard uh, when they're on fire because of the type of, uh, because of the off-gassing. The glue they use is called urea formaldehyde. <clears throat> and uh, this and that when burning, uh, the off-gassing from that, very dangerous. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, synthetic wood it's another, is another type of composite material that's uh, produced in sheets and boards. Um, typically, uh, synthetic wood is manufactured from things like recycled plastic uh, from liquid containers, primarily milk bottles. Um, and synthetic wood is often used for exterior rails, stairs, and decks. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, the construction classifications. So we classify houses um, based on the way that they are constructed. Uh, and we classify them uh, as types one through five. Uh, the buildings are, ba are classified based on the combustibility of the structure and the fire resistant components of that structure. Uh, the fire resistance uh, is typically uh, displayed in hours, uh, and that refers to the length of time that the building or building component can withstand fire before becoming ignited. Um, the type of construction classification is gonna be determined by the structural engineer or the contractor. 
Um, so, and with materials used in construction, we, we know very well how they are going, how these materials are going to resist the exposure to fire. Uh, some of our areas have uh, have building codes uh, or uh, building inspections, and uh, they need to be when we do new construction, when we uh, you know do major additions, uh, they have to be inspected. Um, building codes, uh, not but not all areas within the regional district have that. Um, building codes have to be adopted by the authority having jurisdiction for the CSRD. That's the CSRD, uh, and then we amend them to to meet local requirements. Uh, in Canada, we have the National Building Code, and we also have the BC Building Code, and every province uh, has its own provincial building code. Uh, something we also have to take into account when we're looking at the, uh, the construction classification of a, of a building, um, a renovation can change that structure's classification. It can create structures containing more than one construction method. The structure may appear to be fire resistive, but be vulnerable be, uh, to fire development because of changes that have been made within. Uh, in some cases, it could actually imp it could be uh, constructed to improve fire and life safety through additional fire alarm systems, sprinkler systems, uh, and compartmentalization within the room. So having uh, instead of having wide open concepts, having more uh, smaller rooms located. So that actually helps us prevent fire spread. So just because we think we understand the fire classification on the outside by looking at it and doing our 360, there may be things that are going on inside that uh, that have changed that classification. So the first type of construction classification we're going to talk about is type one. And type one is known as fire resistive. This, this classification of, building, uh, of construction provides the highest level of protection from fire development. Um, it's used in uh, structures designed for large numbers of people uh, and large structures. Uh, also used in special occupancies like schools, government buildings, sports arenas, things like that. So a couple of the uh, the, the key fa key features of type one is that all structural members are composed of non-combustible or limited combustible material with a very high fire resistive rating. So again, we're not using things like wood for for structural members. Everything has to be non-combustible. Uh, so steel is a primary uh, structural member in uh, in type one types of construction. Uh, walls, floors, and ceilings have to be able to resist fire for three to four hours, depending on the component. <clears throat> so that's important to, to know. Three to four hours with a type one res uh, fire resistive structure uh, is how long it goes before, uh, before collapse. Give me one second. <clears throat> um, we can expect uh, type one structures as well to uh, remain structurally stable during the course of the fire while we're there. Uh, it's considered to be the most collapse resistance. Um, reinforced concrete, precast concrete, protective steel frame construction, these are all features that we can expect to find. Um, firewalls will be used to limit the fire spread throughout the structure. Um, so um, in, a lot of times it's also incorrectly, this type of, con of construction is incorrectly referred to as fireproof. Um, the structure will not burn, however, it may, it, it may and will, it will degrade from the effects of a fire. It certainly provides a structural stability. Uh, there are combustible materials that are gonna be present um, that generate sufficient heat over time to compromise the structural integrity. So we have to look at the room contents as well uh, of, uh, of the building uh, and what is the fuel load and what is the uh, heat release rate going to be? How much heat is actually released from the fuel in that structure? It was my fucking internet. Uh, if uh, yeah, if that heat is sufficient enough, it can certainly uh, it can certainly result in structural collapse. I don't have my generator today. Ow. <laughs> All right. Um, conditions that may be present during the fire. Uh, things we need to be aware of. Compartments uh, in a Type One uh, construction they can retain heat. Uh, for quite a long period of time, and that'll con uh, contribute to the, pot uh, the potential for rapid fire development throughout the structure. Um, windows may be non-operating, so if we're thinking we're going to use that as a means of egress for, for people inside, might not be an option. They may not be able to open. Uh, also for ventilation, so if we're looking to, uh, to uh, we, we're likely going to have to take the window, and in a lot of cases, they're using a much uh, uh, thicker form of glass. Uh, so it might take a little more force to actually uh, break windows in these structures. 
Um, in extreme cold conditions, very important to understand, these structures still can collapse. They are not fireproof. They are fire resistant. So the next type we'll talk about here is uh, type two, also known as non-combustible. <clears throat> also, in some cases, limited combustible, they'll call it as well. Um, so this type, uh, type two construction is composed of materials that will not contribute to the fire development or spread. Steel, again, most common structural material. Uh, the materials do not meet the stricter requirements, however, that are required for type one construction. Uh, steel components do not need to be protected for the same lengths of time or have the same fire resistance uh, rating. Um, in their most common form, structures with metal framing members, metal cladding, concrete block construction of walls, uh, with metal deck roofs supported by unprotected open web joists, that's what we can expect to see out in the field. Um, so with type two, we're hoping, we're expecting a fire resistant rating on type two structures uh, for one to two hours, depending on the component. Far, uh, certainly for more, the, these structures are more prone to collapse than type one. Um, uh, and this building uh, uh, construction type is, is normally used when the fire risk is expected to be fairly low, um, when fire suppression and detection systems design, uh, are, uh, are in place, things like sprinklers and fire alarms, perhaps we don't need the added uh, uh, fire resistive uh, properties that you'll find in type one. Uh, and the non-combustible does not reflect the true nature of the structure. And reasons are the lower fire resistive rated, it'll have lower fire resist, resistive ratings uh, that are permitted for the roof and floor systems. That again, leads to more likelihood of collapse. Um, the fire resistant metal and roof decking may be covered with a combustible layer, which can melt and ignite causing another fire. Um, it also, in, in many cases, have combustible features included on the exterior, things like balconies and facades uh, that, uh, that are combustible. So the type three is also known as ordinary construction. You'll hear, you may have also heard, if you've ever done a course with uh, Jack Blair, you'll hear the word, the, the term Main Street USA. Um, so with type three construction, this is most commonly found in older schools, mercantile type, you know, shops, uh, businesses, uh, residential, older residential structures, um, and it's used in a really wide range of buildings, um, usually limited to buildings no more than four stories tall. So what we're looking at with, uh, with, a, with a type three ordinary construction, uh, buildings may have masonry exterior walls, which support the floors and the roof of the structure. So the brick is actually load bearing here. Um, the interior structural components are primarily con uh, constructed of things like wood. Uh, gypsum board or plaster is often used as an interior finish. Uh, tie rods and anchor plates also um, are often used to secure the, uh, the, the brick. And I have a photo of that on the bottom right there. That's, uh, that's a picture of one of those tie rods that's used. Uh, and a lot of times these buildings are older and uh, so the building owner will actually put the, you know, we'll look at it and to prevent the, 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 the mortar starts deteriorating, to prevent it from crumbling and to prevent the wall from falling, they'll put these uh, tie rods and anchor plates in. Under fire conditions, however, we need to be aware of these. Uh, these rods, same as a steel, uh, as a steel structural member, it's going to elongate and fail when heated. Uh, which and this will this could lead to the collapse of the of the of the masonry wall. Uh, limited fire resistance requirements for the interior construction. Um, and basically, what we have when we have ordinary construction, we're going to have two separate fire loads. One will be the contents, and one is a combustible building material. So the structure itself now becomes part of the fire, as opposed to just the contents. Um, the fire resistance on the interior structural components often depends on the age of the building. And whatever and, and local building codes, uh, void spaces will allow the fire to spread as well, and they can spread horizontally or vertically. Uh, there are areas behind the walls, in between floors, that will allow that fire to spread. Uh, exterior walls, floors, and the roof uh, typically they're all connected together. Uh, the collapse and a collapse of the interior structure could make freestanding masonry walls unstable and prone to collapse. So if something inside, if the roof comes down the walls themselves will be more likely to fall out as well. Moving on to type four, heavy timber, also known as mill construction. 
So with type four, what they would, this is characterized by the use of large dimensional lumber. The dimensions vary depending on the building code at the time of construction, but generally the structural members are greater than eight inches in dimension. Uh, so that, and at eight inches, that'll give you a fire rating of about two hours. Um, all structural element dimensions have to have a minimum dimension of sizing. So we're not talking about, and this is one where we can get confused at times because some people may come up and you'll see uh, um, what, what appears to be a log house and you'll say, oh, type four construction. Not necessarily. It still may uh, be the lower construction grade because it's not, because the reinforcements are not, and structural supports are not heavy timber. To be classified as heavy timber, all of the structural supports have to be made of this large dimensional lumber. Uh, a couple of characteristics about it, it very stable, um, very stable buildings, uh, very resistant to collapse. Um, and that's due to the sheer mass of the structural members. Uh, when in heavy fire, uh, the basically these, these large dimensional pieces of wood, um, they have an insulating effect. Um, the, Basically, the the the, heat, the wood will absorb heat. Um, the exterior walls are often constructed in in type four, are often constructed of non combustible uh, non combustible materials. You can see on the bottom right photo there, uh, they're using masonry on the exterior walls. The interior elements are often constructed of solid or laminated wood. Uh, a lot of times you'll have no concealed spaces, so you'll actually see. I mean, when you build with heavy timber, people want to show off that heavy timber. Uh, so you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll have a good, they're, they're not protected in any way, and they're right out in the open. Uh, one of the good things about that, however, is that uh, it uh, limits the amount of voids or concealed spaces and helps, uh, helps to prevent fire travel in areas that we don't see. Um, it, these types of buildings also may include small dimensional lumber glued together to form laminated structural components sometimes and uh, these structural components can be extremely strong um, often found in churches barns auditoriums um, but the beams may fail when exposed to fire uh, because they're being held together basically by glue and uh, they can be and uh, <clears throat> they, they can be very uh, easily affected by heat so a couple of conditions that can affect fire behavior during a fire. Uh, the high concentrations of wood can contribute to uh, the intensity of the fire once it starts. I mean, we're talking everything in here is combustible, although it, uh, you know, they are, we're talking about large dimensional lumber, we're still, it's still combustible. Um, and the collapse of, our ma of those masonry walls uh, can be caused by a, lox lack of, a loss of the structural integrity of the timbers within the structure. And the final type of classification that we have is type five, uh, also known as wood frame or stick frame. Uh, this is the most common type of construction that's used today. It's used in most of our residential houses. Uh, all of the major components here are constructed of wood or other combustible materials. Um, you'll see it used in one and two family dwellings and small commercial buildings. Yeah, it's used all over the place. Um, this type of construction has no uh, fire resistive components included in it. These will often collapse and suffer major destruction, usually create void channels that allow fire to spread quickly. Uh, they can easily extend to nearby buildings and exposures. Um, smoke detectors are essential in this type of construction and that's why we push so hard for residential smoke, uh, smoke alarms within, uh, within residential units. Uh, modern construction techniques rely heavily on uh, wooden I-beams and wooden trusses. Uh, they're, they're just strong enough to carry the, they're, they're strong enough to carry the required load, load, but there's not a huge built-in safety margin on these. Um, these buildings can collapse early and suddenly, and these new wooden I-beams, they're made with uh, often uh, material. They're made with these composite materials that, uh, like a particle board, that are glued together. Uh, the inner piece of the I-beam is actually just particle board and it'll have two two by fours on either end. Um, they're great in terms of cost effectiveness, lightweight, uh, much easier to get, you know, for, for the, uh, the, the, um, the, the crews to actually put up these buildings, much faster to build buildings uh, and, and, uh, and economical. For us as firefighters, however, these structural components 
are known to fail very quickly. And that could be roof supports, it could be in floor supports, um, and we need to be aware of that as well. It also, with the glues, they're gonna add another, uh, you know, another element to the heat release rate. More heat is released from that much quicker than we would get if we were using straight wood. Um, so a lot of times, uh, we, these, uh, these types of, this type of construction might be covered with wood, vinyl, or aluminum siding, um, possibly a brick veneer, possibly stucco. Um, just because you see a brick covering does not mean the building is constructed of brick walls, right? So that's another mistake we often make, uh, both with the, the ordinary construction, type three, and with the heavy timber construction, type four. Uh, we can make the mistake of thinking it's one of those when it actually is a type five construction. So what will happen is the structural fire will cause that veneer to collapse or peel away as the wall behind it burns. Firefighters need to be aware of the construction of the building. We need to, we need to get a sense of that. We can't do it again. We need to understand what the structural supports of that building are. Um, just, to, just looking at the veneer and saying, oh, heavy timber, oh, ordinary, that doesn't cut it. We need to, we need to know what that's actually, what's actually holding this up. Um, so we also need to be aware that uh, in, in this type of construction, in any type of construction, uh, um, we need to understand collapse zones. Uh, and we need to set collapse zones up certainly on a type five construction uh, um, fire. Uh, and the collapse zone for any kind of building, uh, as many of you are aware, is one and a half times the height of the wall that, uh, or the height of the, the structure that may collapse. Uh, a couple of different types of construction techniques we should be aware of as well with type five, balloon frame construction, um, very popular type of construction between the 1800s and the mid 1900s. Um, basically what we've got there is uh, it's assembled with, with wood studs that are continuous from the basement to the roof. Uh, and then there's also platform construction. That's a different type. And with that, you've got uh, exterior wall and studs that are not continuous. So with the balloon frame, and I believe I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, and maybe I'll just talk about it now. But with the balloon frame, if you get a fire in the walls, you've got nothing stopping it. You've got a one straight run from the, from the ground floor all the way up. Uh, where that fire gets inside, and it can go and be in the roof and travel to the other side of the building and come out somewhere else. Uh, the platform frame construction uh, technique came around to actually prevent that from happening. So the studs are no longer continuous. The floors are kind of built as platforms, which, and that'll slow that fire spread. So instead of the fire being able to go all the way up to the roof, it'll stop at this platform that was created. So outside of our type one to five construction, uh, there are other types of residences that we will come across, uh, you know, in our job. And uh, these are manufactured homes. Um, typically, these are structures that are built in a factory and shipped to the location to be installed. Um, mobile homes have axle assemblies under the frame. Uh, these make up 25% of all housing sales in the US. Uh, I believe, I don't know what it is in Canada, but that's what I have for, for the US. Uh, the fire resistance of these is going to uh, vary depending on the age. Those built before 1976 have a, a lower fire resistance than current construction, but I can tell you all of these structures go up fairly quickly. It's a lightweight construction and lightweight building materials. Uh, these are susceptible to very early fail, uh, failure in a fire. Uh, the heat produced by the contents can also cause, uh, cause uh, the structure to ignite or melt uh, rapidly. Um, the contents have the same fuel load as, as con conventional structures. Uh, they just, uh, the structure itself does not have the same fire resistance. Um, this does make forced entry easier uh, because the walls can be very quickly breached. We can go in through the side of one of these very easily, much, much more easier than any of the other construction classifications. Um, the uh, manufacturer's homes uh, may be anchored directly to a concrete slab. Um, so, or they may have open crawl spaces underneath. The crawl spaces would uh, provide an extra, uh, additional source of oxygen during a fire. And then just a couple of different occupancy classifications to, to keep in mind as well. Um, these are defined typically by building code and life safety code uh, that's adopted by the authority having jurisdiction. So we look at single use, um, Single use basically means it's, it's there for one specific purpose. 
uh, the, uh, the building must uh, meet whatever the building code is for that intended use. If it's a school, it must meet the building code for schools, government buildings uh, for a government building, farm, farm. Um, so an example of this might be office buildings. Um, again, the, the building occupancy classification. Uh, so generally they're going to be classified by their primary function. Uh, when, especially if the structure contains multiple types of uses. So a furnishing plant is classified as a manufacturing occupancy, contains uh, storage of raw materials, finished products, offices, and manufacturing. Well, it's a furniture manufacturing plant. With the separated use, uh, we're looking at structures that contain multiple occupancies or use groups. Uh, these have to meet the requirements for each type of occupancy within that structure. So an example in a strip mall, the retail, outlet, if you had a retail outlet, an office, maybe a restaurant, well, the retail outlet is going to have to meet the requirements for mercantile occupancy. The offices are going to have to meet business occupancy. Restaurants are going to have to meet assembly occupancy. So all of those have to be met within the one single structure. Um, the occupancies often change over time um, and they don't often update and, and uh, certainly don't update us um, but they certainly and and the fire and they don't put when they do updates they don't necessarily put the right fire uh, separations in there either uh, a lot of times you'll have unauthorized or non-code compliant penetration so you know there'll be they'll, there will be uh, because of the you might have had a, a building that used two of the the storefronts so they had to open up that wall well if they put a wall back up perhaps that wall isn't fire resistive the way it's supposed to be for those type of structures so we have to be aware of that however they should uh, you know they should have fire separation between each of them they should be their own contained units So another, uh, so now we'll talk about some components uh, of, of buildings. Um, foundations. Uh, foundations are designed to support the weight of a building and all of its contents. Um, and they may be shallow, they may be deep, uh, really depends on what you're building for. Uh, a shallow foundation is only going to extend a few meters into the, into the earth. Uh, it sits on a footing made of poured, uh, from poured reinforced concrete or concrete blocks. Um, uh, single story basements, uh, you know, may be constructed this way as well. Um, first floor, the first floor constructed on the foundation uh, could take one of two forms. Uh, it could be a solid concrete slab on that first floor uh, or a stem wall with wood or metal joist floor. Uh, that, if they use the stem wall, you're creating a vo another crawl space between the floor and the soil below. Now, if we look at deep foundations, these are used to support the mass of large buildings uh, or very tall buildings. Um, these could include things like piers, pilings driven into the soil, um, drifted shafts, uh, caissons, piers, uh, earth stabilizing columns. <clears throat> uh, you may have multiple basement levels resting on these piers. Uh, specialized systems may be used also for places that are earthquake prone. We'll talk about floors and ceilings. Basically, these just form the top and bottom of our structure, right? Um, the walls will form the side. Uh, construction varies depending on uh, on uh, on the level we're talking about. At ground level, we may be looking at a concrete slab or a four joist assembly made up of joists and decking over a crawl space or a basement. Uh, upper floors of a multi-story building, you're usually looking at things like joists and decking with uh, you know with the ceiling attached at some point. Um, and then uh, at the very top level, again, ceiling and joist rafters, a uh, roof above. Uh, the space that's formed by the, by the floor or ceiling uh, may contain things like ductwork, um, electrical or communication wiring, water or natural gas pipes, pipes for fire suppression systems, the recessed lighting, speakers for audio systems may be located above the ceiling. Uh, things like fiberglass, cellulose, or foam insulation could be there as well. Uh, it, and and uh, it may be constructed using a combination of materials. Floors may be poured reinforced concrete, um, uh, but uh, they may have metal decking, finished wood tile, carpet, a carpeted surface uh, over top of it. Um, ceilings are generally may, uh, finished with gypsum board. Um, uh, it could be tin tiles, uh, lathe and plaster uh, also. 
in uh, corridors that are designated as an exit or an egress pathway, the ceilings have the same fire resistant ratings as the walls in the corridor. Uh, the materials used to cover the floors are also rated to limit the flammability in the corridor. And again, the rating is always in how many hours they're going to withstand the effects of fire. We talked about floors and ceilings. Let's talk about the walls. Uh, the walls define the perimeter of the building and, and can also divide it within the building into compartments or rooms. Um, exterior walls could be made of any number of things. Uh, wood or metal siding could be attached to the studs. Uh, a single layer of concrete could also be used. Uh, concrete blocks, logs. Uh, the wall assemblies typically consist of um, a bottom plate, a top plate, uh, vertical studs, horizontal braces, and they're sandwiched between two surfaces of gypsum or lathe and plaster or some other, um, some other finishing there. Uh, with this type of construction, there's going to be a cavity formed between the two surfaces. Uh, it's a dead airspace or a void. Uh, often that's going to contain some type of insulation, especially when that's an exterior wall. Uh, so a couple of types of walls we need to talk about here, uh, load-bearing and non-load-bearing walls. So load-bearing um, walls are, are interior and exterior walls that support the weight of the structure. Uh, very important to understand that. Load-bearing walls, when they fail, the structure is coming down. Non-load-bearing walls are walls that only support their own weight. They're just there, again, as a room divider. May act as a partition wall dividing two areas of the structure. Uh, another type of wall to be aware of is a firewall, and I've got a picture there of a firewall um, that's it's gone up between a couple of buildings. Um, often these firewalls are constructed of a variety of masonry materials, um, materials that don't burn. Uh, it's intended to provide a separation that meets the requirement for that specific uh, resistance rating that's needed in that building. Um, these kind of assemblies include a wall structure, doors, windows, and any other protective openings. Uh, they all have to meet the fire protective rating. So if we put a door in there, it has to be fire protective. If, uh, if there's any other kind of penetration that's gone into that, it has to meet the same fire protection rating. Uh, using this type of uh, firewall, assemblies can divide large structures into smaller portions. You can this will also allow us to, to stop a fire and, and say, we're going to make our stand at this firewall here and uh, prevent the fire from traveling through the rest of the building. So something we need to be aware of as well uh, is with walls, um, those of you who've taken the RIT course have had to do what's called the wall breach um, and, you know, understanding where and when we can do that kind of thing. You know, if we get into trouble, we may end up having to go through one of these walls uh, because a door or a window or some other form of egress isn't available to us. So we're actually going to have to go through uh, a wall. Uh, understanding which ones you can go through and which ones you can't go through is very important. Uh, exterior walls and firewalls, don't even try, right? They're, they're going to be the most difficult, no way to get through them, uh, forcing entry or escaping an area, going through a firewall uh, or an exterior wall is not your best bet. Um, some interior walls uh, are, are, can be, um, but, uh, you know, but we want to be very careful with that as well because as we talked about inside of walls, we could find any number of things, including the electrical wiring, pipes, um, and all sorts of other things. So yeah, water plumbing, so I did touch on this already a little bit before, right? With the balloon frame and the platform frame. But this, uh, this is a great uh, kind of demonstration of those two different uh, styles. So picture on the left, balloon frame. We're looking at, it's, it, this was very popular again in the 1800s and mid 1900s. So, you know, I know a lot of our older houses uh, may, may have balloon frame construction. Um, Again, assembled with wood studs that are continuous. So you can see the wood studs in that photo right from the basement all the way up to the, up to the roof level, right? Uh, creates a top to bottom path for that fire spread. Fire started in that bottom corner. There's nothing stopping it from traveling right up into the roof and the rafter area. But the platform frame construction, the, uh, the exterior wall studs are not continuous. You can see there is a break right there. So the fire coming up, it will hit that platform. It will not be able to extend up into the chimney area, in, sorry, into the ceiling area. Um, the floors are built as platforms. Great. We'll talk a little bit about uh, roofs now. So, I mean, with a roof, we all know primary function is to protect the, uh, the structure, the interior of the structure from the, uh, from, and the contents inside from the effects of weather. Um, the shape and construction is intended to typically provide some kind of drainage, uh, support the weight uh, of accumulations of snow, 
uh, resist the effects of wind, insulate the, ex the interior from external temperature changes. Um, the geographic location of the structure is going to influence the type of construction. Uh, you know, if you're not expecting to have low uh, of having any snow, you're living in Florida, maybe uh, you can you can have a, a, a different style of roof than what might work around here or in the or in the mountains where uh, where we do tend to get higher snow loads. Uh, penetrations and openings can indicate uh, the general arrangement of the rooms within, right? So they can help us uh, understand what's going on inside the building by looking at the roof and seeing the different penetrations and openings. So with roofs, there are three really prevalent types and those common roof types are on the photo on the left there. Um, they're flat, pitched and arched. Uh, some buildings might have a combination of designs. Um, so some of the less common styles, certainly uh, you can see on the right there, maybe the sawtooth, I don't, you don't see uh, uh, quite as often. The butterfly isn't quite as popular, but we all, but we might, I'm sure we've all seen something like that before. Um, with flat roofs, uh, they're common on commercial, industrial, multi, and sometimes on multi-family residential structures. Um, sometimes you'll see it on a, on a single family as well, if, you know, and, and I've seen a few of those around town here too. Um, generally, they have a, some kind of slight slope towards the outer edge, um, and that'll help with the drainage. Um, a lot of times, and these are frequently penetrated by things like chimneys, vent pipes, uh, shafts, skylights. Um, the flat roof also might be surrounded by what's called a parapet, uh, by parapet walls. Uh, divided by, or divided by fire separation walls that extend from the foundation up to above the roof. Uh, other things we might find on flat roofs include things like water tanks, HVAC equipment, antennas, solar panels, signs, other obstructions, all this may be present. Uh, no two fires are the same, no two roofs are going to be the same. Understanding, you know, when we look up on there, we need to be aware of, of what we're dealing with. But all of these openings can kind of give us a general indication of what we're looking at inside the structure as well. When we talk about pitched roofs, um, these are the most common. There's a, and, there, and there are so many different kinds of, of styles of pitched roofs. Um, the most common is the elevated center along the ridge line with the roof deck that slopes down to the eaves along the sides. Um, shed roof is another you know, type of, uh, <coughs> of a pitch, but the de and the deck slopes to the eaves at one, at one end. Uh, the construction of pitched roofs usually involves rafters or trust, trusses that can run from the ridge line um, to the outer wall at the eaves level. Uh, and they're made of typically wood or metal. Uh, roofs will have a decking or a sheathing applied at right angles over the rafters uh, and may be applied solidly or with boards. Um, arched roofs. <clears throat> Sometimes these arch roofs may be ideal for certain types of occupancies because they, they span over large areas and they're not, they don't need to be supported by columns, pillars, or posts. Um, often you'll see these arched roofs more likely to be um, used late 1800s, mid 1900s. It's not as common now, but they still occur. Um, so some of the types that you might uh, the, that we'll see with the arch roofs are the bowstring, ribbed, diagonal grid, and a pleated barrel. So now we'll talk a little bit with roofs about the uh, supporting structure. So first thing we're going to say though is with a roof you've got three major components of it. First is going to be the supporting structure, next is called decking, and the last is the covering. So we'll start off by talking about the supporting structure of the roof. This is what's going to give it all of its strength and structural stability. So um, typically when we're talking about roof supports, we're talking about things like uh, beams and truss assemblies. So beams um, are sections of lumber located directly under the roof decking. Uh, so these beams will extend from the ridge line or a pole at the peak to each side of a pitched roof. Uh, they'll extend from wall to wall on a flat roof. Uh, they may be exposed or concealed behind a ceiling. Uh, and generally these are gonna be made of solid timbers, four by four inch and larger. Uh, truss assemblies may be constructed on site, uh, and these are sometimes on site, often pre-manufactured and shipped right to the site, so, the, uh, so they don't even need to be put together when they get there. Um, 
the ones that are constructed on site usually have a top, have a, it will certainly have top and bottom cords of, uh, and there's going to be a webbing on the in, uh, inside that holds it together. Um, they're assembled uh, often using these metal gusset plates. And that photo on the right is a, is a picture of a metal gusset plate. Uh, again, this is part of that lightweight construction that we're getting into now. So holding together these, uh, these joints uh, in the truss assemblies, um, it's just a plate like that. And the, the spikes on them are very, very small. Um, very easy to use. You put it, you slap it on, you give it a couple of whacks with a hammer and boom, it's, it, the whole thing is together instead of having to nail each piece on individually and you know, bending nails and all that kind of thing. This is much easier as far as construction goes. Um, but we need to be aware that in fire conditions, they can fail very quickly because as we've spoken about with other metals, the, when metal heats, it expands. We have very small very spikes in the, in the wood. So when this expands, it doesn't have to expand too much before that entire gusset plate can pop out. If that does happen, now there is nothing left that's holding uh, the, the truss support together. Uh, and you'll find uh, roof collapse will happen very, very quickly. Um, some other behavior and fire conditions we need to be aware of is that solid wood joists uh, will tend to lose their strength gradually when exposed to fire. I mean, wood deteriorates, wood will be consumed in the fire. Uh, roofs may become soft or spongy before a failure. Um, we're not going to know that because we aren't going to be going on those roofs typically in a, in a structure fire as per our SOGs. Um, but this is something to be aware of if you are, you know, we, that uh, the roof will sometimes, you, sometimes you'll feel that, sometimes you won't. Um, a soft roof is not the only sign of collapse, so the plywood and OSB used for sheathing can fail very quickly without prior warning. Um, so box beams and I-beams, we've talked about those a little bit, but uh, you, often these are going to be used to support flat roofs and floors. Um, again, made from plywood and wood truss joints. Um, they provide good strength, uh, but that thin web portion of that I-beam in between um, and the members used to manufacture the truss renders it, renders it like very, very susceptible to an early failure in a fire. That glue will heat up, that, will, that webbing will deteriorate and be burned through very rapidly. And once the webbing in between is gone, you've got, again, you're going to have nothing really there supporting that floor structure or that ceiling structure. <clears throat> so, um, while I'm on it, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the increased use of engineered or lightweight construction and truss support systems. Um, so with engineered construction, you know, we, I, I, there's the term mass over math, and I really like that, that concept. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, we used big, the, 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 the heavy timbers, the big beams, you know, uh, six by six and greater when you're looking, depend, you know, uh, for roof supports and things. Now they're using math and they're using engineering. Uh, so we don't have the same size structures, they, and, and what, what we get is very uh, cost-effective, uh, easy to manufacture, uh, and, and very strong homes. But under fire conditions, they do deteriorate rapidly, and they, the fire progresses much quicker, and, uh, and, uh, and collapse will happen much quicker. Um, so lightweight construction is going to be more common in types of one, uh, in, types, uh, in type five construction. Sorry, um, it's going to be also in homes, apartments, small buildings, uh, commercial businesses. <clears throat> you might find lightweight steel trusses that are made from long steel cords that are straight or bent sometimes by 90 degrees. Um, lightweight wood and trusses um, and those gusset plates. All of these are, are well, you know, they've, they've brought us a long way as far as building construction goes. Uh, Unfortunately, they don't think about us in those situations. So uh, these are far more likely to collapse uh, and far more likely to spread fire much more rapidly. Okay, so we've talked about the supporting structure of the roof. Let's talk a little bit about the roof deck. Um, so what the roof deck is, it's basically just the portion of the roof between the roof supports and the roof covering. So the roof, um, when we, we'll go on and talk about roof coverings next, but that's where your shingles or your tin is gonna be. Um, Type of decking that we might use in North America are things like plywood, um, OSB, uh, tongue and groove, uh, reinforced concrete. Um, and typically the components for this are going to be a, a sheathing, uh, roof planks or slabs, and um, purlins. So this, the decking itself, however, can act as a bit of a roof support. 
Um, an example would be like a concrete deck on the roof, right? Um, the roof covering may be the same um, as, uh, as the rest of the building uh, was used to, for the covering. <clears throat> Uh, with concrete roofs in North America, we may have two different types. There's precast and there's poured in place. Um, so pre with precast, pretty straightforward. It's fabricated somewhere off site. Then it's hauled to the construction site and, and uh, ready to use and it's installed. Um, precast planks are, uh, and precast planks are made from lightweight concrete reinforced with steel mesh or rods. So now that we've talked a bit about decks, we'll talk a bit about the roof coverings. And this is just very simply the part of the roof that's exposed to weather. All sorts of different types of material, all of them will react differently in, in fire conditions. Um, for example, starting off with wooden shingles or shakes, rough cut wood, that is going to add to the fuel load and will certainly uh, have no fire resistive uh, properties to it at all. Um, you might have rubber uh, or imitation shingle or tiles, uh, asphalt shingles, very common, something that we'll see, but they also are, are, are combustible. Um, terracotta or concrete tile, um, that's not something you're gonna see a lot around here, um, but again, they're, they're not gonna contribute to fire spread, but they will crack and they can uh, cause a falling hazard. Uh, so having your helmet on, very important around those. Um, you might have uh, built up tar and gravel surfaces as well. You'll see that on the top of things like schools and in, in other industrial settings. Um, metal roof systems um, or sheets of metal. Uh, got that on my house right now. They're great, 100 year roofs, uh, slide all the snow right off of it and don't hold the snow load, uh, except they keep sliding right on my driveway. Uh, and in some cases, you'll also find them made with uh, composite materials. So I talked a little bit about this before when we were talking about roofs, about the penetrations and the openings. So basically a penetration or opening is basically a, a variety of different things. Uh, and typically they're there to provide light, possibly ventilation, sometimes access, uh, exhaust. Um, it could be part of the, uh, the, the, the plumbing or the HVAC system. Um, the penetrations can indicate the location of some types of rooms. So when we look and we do our 360 and we look on the roof of a building by seeing these types of penetrations, we may be able to get a sense of the floor plan inside of that building. Um, in bathrooms, if we have a vent, you know, coming out in a certain location, uh, sometimes mechanical spaces because of, you know, the different equipment that we'll see on top of there. Um, but types of penetrations or openings we may come into contact with, obviously we're skylights. Um, there's ventilation shafts, uh, there are chimneys, HVAC units, bathroom vent pipes, attic vents, dormers, all of these can be considered penetrations and openings. So uh, it's possible to gain access to the attics through, through using some of these penetrations. Uh, you know, small, uh, we might be able to get in through a skylight if we did vertical ventilation, which we don't. Um, and in some cases, there may be what's called a cock loft that could be used as a, an exit point for some types of ventilation. So maybe if we're able to get that door open, now we can actually ventilate uh, vertically without actually without having to stand on a roof and open it that way. So sometimes we'll see on uh, on bigger industrial buildings, you'll see roof mounted equipment like this. Um, it's present on most types of commercial, industrial, institutional, educational, and sometimes even in residential structures. Um, it, what this, uh, what this uh, kind of equipment does is it actually adds a live load to a dead load that's, uh, that's already distributed on the roof. Okay, the live load, that's the, width, that's the weight of the people or the goods or anything added to the building, right? The dead load is the intrinsic weight of a structure itself. So we're now adding, a, you've now added a live load by adding this Electric, uh, this uh, equipment onto the roof. Um, usually this is gonna be found on things like flat roofs and under rain roofs. Um, again, this includes things like HVAC units, sometimes even water towers or telecommunications equipment. You might have telephone towers, radio transmission. Um, some places, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of it around here, but you'll find, you know, advertising signs, um, you know, wind turbines, uh, electrical transformers, just about anything could be on top of there. 
so we need to be aware of this for, for one primary reason, and that is it can injure or kill firefighters by causing a collapse of that fire weakened roof. Uh, it can cause that roof to, to collapse quicker than we would have expected it to. So we need to be aware of the fire behavior and how it affects the building. We also need to be aware of the general design and construction of the building and what extra components have been added to it. All right, stairs. So stairs, pretty straightforward. We know what they do. They, they provide access or egress from different levels of a structure. Um, if they're needed to be, a, if, they're, if they've been designed to be a means of egress, so they're, they're designed to be a way for us to exit a structure, um, they need to be protected uh, or enclosed, and they need to be uh, built to resist the spread of fire and smoke. Uh, if they're not required to be a means of egress, they're typically uh, connected to, they're typically like just connecting two or more levels. Uh, these are called access or convenience stairs. All right, so we can also classify them as interior or exterior stairs, depending on the location of them. Um, they take a lot of different types of forms, a lot of different ways they can be built. Um, fire escapes, escalators, and fixed ladders, we need to be aware as well, are no longer allowed to be used as a means of, as a required means of egress. So uh, building codes have been updated so that these are no longer considered means of egress. So with protected stairs, uh, we're looking at uh, something that's going to be critically a critical component for the building's life safety system. Okay, so these are going to be enclosed with uh, fire rated construction, usually at least a one or a two hour rating. Um, they're going to serve obviously two or more stories and these are part of a required means of egress. Um, it's going to be the primary way that you're actually going to get out. Uh, these can uh, adversely affect the safety of occupants if they don't maintain a breathable atmosphere. So if the smoke starts getting into these, uh, into these stairwells, that is going to be catastrophic for people trying to exit the building. So, exit, uh, so exterior, exterior stairs, uh, they could be either open air or enclosed. Uh, enclosed, they have to comply with the requirements similar to interior protected stairs. Um, so if we're using exterior stairs as, as our way of egress during a fire, if that's what the, 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 the building has, uh, they need to be protected the same way as if it was an interior stair. Uh, if they're open, they're already naturally ventilated um, and, uh, and so we don't have to have that same rating. So I, so I touched quickly on, on, uh, on uh, sorry, what was it, uh, fire escapes there. Um, Fire escapes, you, I'm sure you've seen them before. They're open metal stairs and landings attached to the outside of the building. Um, uh, sometimes you'll have like a swinging stair section at the lowest section uh, so that people can't climb up and, and gain unwanted access. Uh, these were in place for many, many years. Usually they're anchored to the building. Um, but these anchor points uh, have been found to be very uh, uh, susceptible to the freeze-thaw cycles uh, in the environment there. So. Um, they're also susceptible to corrosion uh, from pollution, weather, uh, and, and vast temperature changes. The mortar for the anchors may suffer from deterioration over time and becoming inadequate to, to hold the load of people coming down. So no longer are fire escapes permitted in most, in most jurisdictions as a primary means of escape from a fire. So when we're talking about smoke-proof stair enclosures, uh, because like I said, you start, if this is gonna be your primary means of egress, uh, that's, and that stairwell all of a sudden becomes filled with smoke, that is catastrophic. So there are some that are actually smoke-proof. We may not find a lot of them in our, in our own jurisdictions, but it's good to be aware of them. Um, so basically you're either gonna have some kind of active or maybe a passive smoke control. Uh, a mechanical ventilation system. So that photo on the right is a, is a good uh, uh, example of a uh, smoke-proof uh, stair enclosure. Uh, and it's, it's actually automatically activated uh, when fire or smoke is present. Uh, and it'll keep the, yeah, just, it'll keep the smoke- just like out. the company. Yeah. It'll, like you see. it'll keep smoke out <laughs> uh, by pressurizing. So for those of you who joined me for ventilation, one of my favorite topics, uh, you'll remember higher pressure. Uh, you won't have fire spread in areas where we have created an area of higher pressure. It is going to seek out areas of lower pressure. So these stairwells have their, in, in many cases, have their own fan. That fan, much like our positive pressure ventilation fan, is going to pressurize that stairwell and prevent smoke and fire spread into that area. 
So the last type of stair I'll talk to you about is your basic unprotected stairs. These are not protected in any is way. That, uh, sorry, yep. Sean, is that, um, are those fans operated out of the electricity? Will it affect when you shut the electricity down or are they a separate system? I would imagine that they would have some kind of uh, backup uh, power system on them as well. I'm not, I, I've never built them before and I haven't come across that question before, Annette, but I would certainly uh, expect that if this is part of the life safety system of, uh, of a building, when something is made into a life safety system, there has to be backups and redundancies to prevent failure in the event of the emergencies. If it's gonna shut down because the power goes off, which is very likely in the event of a fire, that's not a very good system. So with unprotected stairs, again, um, not enclosed, not fire rated, um, and they can actually serve as a path for fire spread, right? So now we've got an area that's not pressurized, fire can travel in it very easily, um, not going to protect anybody from the products of combustion. Um, oftentimes we call these access or convenience stairs. Um, they can be used as part of an exit system in a two-story building, but they, should, they can, in a, in a multi-story, multi-unit uh, residence, these, these shouldn't be the primary, the, the only way out of a building. Okay, doors. So doors vary widely in operation and their construction, their design, their style. Um, and when we classify doors, uh, as you can see the, with the, uh, some of the examples I have on this slide, um, we're classifying by the way they op operate. Okay, so you can see swinging, that's how it operates, sliding, folding, vertical, revolving. So it's all in the way that the door operates, all right? So swinging doors, rotate on a vertical axis using hinges, right? So pretty, we know what that is. Um, either uh, sometimes they can be single or double leaf, they can be uh, single acting, so they only swing in one direction, or double acting, some can actually swing in two directions. Um, and generally you, you require some kind of swinging door as an exit door, the, as a means of egress. They're easy to operate, everybody knows how they work, we can all get out that way. And usually you want them to swing outward when you're coming out from the building. Uh, sliding doors, um, they're on an overhead track, use steel or nylon rollers. Um, basically, their main advantage is that they eliminate the door swing that might interfere with the use of, uh, of the interior space. So as you know, a homeowner, I don't want to have a door sitting in my living room when I open it up. It just, this door will slide over to the side and not take up any of my living space. Uh, they're also used in things like elevators, obviously, uh, you know, power operated doors and storefront entrances might be uh, sliding. Uh, fire doors uh, are used to protect openings that are not part of a means of egress are often sliding. Uh, the sliding doors are never allowed to be considered a part of a means of e egress. It's basically not, when, when we're taking that into, when we're looking at that as far as how are people going to get out of a structure, sliding doors are never the, are never the option. Uh, folding doors, uh, these are, you know, hung from a overhead track with rollers or guides, very similar to a sliding door, um, but they can be bought by folding or multi-folding. So by folding has one fold in the center, multi-folding you may have, it's almost like an accordion folding up, right? Um, we find these, they, they could be found in residential occupancies, um, places of assembly, sometimes uh, as a way to divide different sections. So we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, some, something similar to that to d divide conference rooms into different sections. Um, and, uh, and again, you can, they can also be used as, uh, you know, horizontal fire doors, um, but they have to meet a very specific requirement if that's what they're going to be used for. So with vertical doors, it's like a garage door, right? It opens on a vertical plane. So you basically go from the bottom, you lift it up. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's usually provided with some kind of uh, counterbalance to help overcome the weight of the door. Um, it, may be on, it might be on weights or springs to help that door go up and, uh, and, and not keep traveling all the way down. Uh, they can be raised manually, mechanically, uh, via a chain hoist, or they could be power operated. Revolving doors, um, again, not something we're going to come into very often in our in our day to day uh, around here, um, but uh, the revolving doors. I mean, they they they're designed to minimize the airflow inside the building, right? And they do that by as they re, as they revolve. There's really never an open path to the outside from the inside. 
Um, big thing for us though, if we ever do come across uh, revolving doors, really prevents the movement of hose or equipment into a building. We cannot be going through an operational revolving door uh, with hose. It's just not going to work. We're not going to be able to get it through. Uh, if you, and also if you get crowds of people trying to use a revolving door as a means of egress, that can become catastrophic as well, where people can all of a sudden pile up on each other and not be able to get out. All right, so doors can also be classified by style, construction, and material, right? So we talk about different types with the panel door. Um, yeah, well, first the material. Uh, it's gonna the, the material is going to influence the effectiveness as a fire barrier. Um, wood, we know that's combustible. Metal, uh, often we're using things like aluminum or carbon. Um, or there could be other types, uh, you know, manufactured with a veneer of a, a hardy board, a fiberglass, or plastics. So when we look at a panel door, uh, we've got what this consists of is vertical and horizontal members uh, that frame a rectangular area. Um, it's typically thin panels of wood, glass, or louvers in place uh, in that framed area. Um, so with solid core doors, these are formed with an interior core of laminated blocks or wood. So um, basically the core is typically covered with two or three layers of some kind of uh, material, usually like a plywood or something like that. Uh, if the interior, uh, if interior safety is a concern, they might have a, some kind of sheet metal as well in, in a solid corridor. A hollow corridor uh, is constructed with spacers between the face panels to, pr to provide lateral support. So you can see the spacers in the, in the picture on the left there. Uh, of the hollow corridor. Uh, that's all there is. The rest of it is basically void space, right? These are less expensive doors. They're lighter. Um, they have very limited thermal uh, or sound insulating value at all. Um, they're usually used for interior, uh, you know, in between bedrooms. So fire barriers. When we talk about fire barriers with doors, solid core doors are going to be better than panel or hollow core. I mean, it's just going to take longer for that fire to consume the material and actually go inside and, and actually travel to that room. Uh, so a, a solid core door can act as a pretty significant barrier and any door acts as, a, as an excellent barrier uh, if it's closed at the time of the fire. And, a couple of materials that we could also be using, things like glass, uh, could be used in exterior and interior applications and found in most occupancy. Um, building quality codes require that if you have a glass door, it's gonna be made of a tempered glass that resists breakage. But if it does break, you're not gonna have the big chunks of jagged uh, glass coming down. You're gonna have you know, the tiny P-shaped things that aren't gonna be quite the same hazard as you would have with the, with the plate glass. You could also sometimes make uh, glass doors with, uh, with uh, plastics. So it might be made with you know, a plexiglass or also one called Lexan. Uh, these are other options. Uh, metal doors. Uh, hollow metal can be used uh, as either you can make them panel or flush. Normally you're looking at about you know, 45 millimeters, which inch and three quarters thick. Um, so they can be constructed of some uh, heavy corrugated steel. Uh, the steel frame supports one or two corrugated sheets and it has an interior core material like styrofoam or something like that. So fire door is the final one on my, on my slide here on the far right there. Um, these protect openings in fire rated walls. The opening is the doorway uh, and these doors are put there to, pr to protect that. Um, when they're properly maintained and operated, they're very effective at limiting the spread of the fire and fire damage inside of a structure. Um, they differ quite significantly from ordinary doors in construction, um, as well as the hardware that they use, the extent to which they might, and in some cases, they may even be designed to close automatically in the event of a fire. Uh, to, to qualify as a fire rated door, the entire assembly has to pass a test by a third party uh, testing agency. That includes things like the hinges, the latches, the locks, all of it has to pass these, uh, these uh, testing. Um, the assembly can be certified as a single unit for a specified, it has to be certified as a single unit for a specified time. And these fire doors are going to be identified by a label. 
uh, I don't know how many of us say, you know, but they only work when they're closed. It's not a fire door if it's not closed. If it's an automatic closing fire door, that's great. It's gonna, it'll, it will, uh, you know, typically shut itself once the fire alarm goes off or this uh, smoke detector of some sort. Um, but uh, there's a lot of passive doors out there that uh, we need to close. And you, you go into occupancies all the time and you see them propped open. We want the airflow, whatever. It's not doing its job. It's there as a fire door. So uh, if it's not closed, it's not going to do its job. So a couple of different types. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different types of fire doors. There might be swinging, pretty common, like the one in the photo that I have in the photo here. Um, you'll find those in stairwells, corridors. Um, they could be, and, and like I said, they could be automatic, which will, uh, you know, they'll remain open and then they'll close during a fire. Um, or they'll be self-closing, uh, which means they remain closed. And typically if they're, you know, that's the two options. They're not gonna be ones that, you know, if you open them, um, if they're not automatic shutting, they're going to close themselves, you know, uh, they're going to close themselves to be, um, behind you. The only way to keep them open is to prop them open. And that's what some people do. Again, can, be, <laughs> can cause real problems for us in, in, uh, in the event of a structure fire. Other types of fire doors, there's uh, rolling fire doors. You'll find these sometimes in industrial occupancy. It's very much like the, the vertical door that we had, the garage door type thing. Um, there's often with those uh, a releasing device of some type uh, that activate during a fire. Uh, and that closes using the force of gravity. gravity. Um, basically, there's like a fusible link in there and that fusible link is, uh, it melts uh, when, when subjected to heat. And once it melts, uh, this heavy uh, roller door, now the gravity is going to pull it, all, pull it down and it's going to shut. Uh, there's also, for fire doors, there might be horizontal sliding. Uh, you, these are found in older industrial buildings. They're also held open typically by a fusible link. Um, and they close along a track using a counterweight. So it'll, it, it shuts kind of like an elevator door uh, would shut. All right, windows. So uh, important to also understand just briefly a little bit about the construction of, of windows. A um, few different uh, things we have on the screen here, the frame. Um, so the frame basically is the perimeter of the window uh, and it's, it's going to be affixed to the, to the wall. The sash um, is uh, the framed unit that may be included with the, within the window frame. It could be fixed or movable. So you, uh, can I see the sash here? There it is, the window frame sash. Uh, <clears throat> the frame, uh, sorry, we already talked about that. Still, the, the window sill, that's the lowest horizontal member of the window frame. That's going to support all the weight of the hardware and the sash. And then, of course, the glass uh, in window circles, known as glazing. Uh, it could be single glazed, double glazed, triple glazed, uh, depending on how much insulation value they're trying to get out of that glass. Um, so it's typically also got some kind of in, an inert gas, like argon, in between the, in between the layers of glass. And uh, that's going to have an insulating effect as well. Oftentimes you'll also find now uh, retracting shades located in between the panes of glass. So a bunch of different, different, a bunch of different styles of, uh, of windows that we can look at. Um, so understand, you know, the first one I'll talk about, not on, not, it's not appearing in this, in this PowerPoint presentation, but fixed windows, uh, they're just non-operable. They don't move. Um, if we want it open, we need to be able to uh, take the glass using a pike pole or some other tool. Uh, the, all the rest of the windows we'll talk about are, are basically can be classified under the larger category of movable or operable windows. So uh, you can see the single hung on the, uh, on the top left there. It's only one sash that's openable. So you open it from the top, maybe you open it or sorry, from the bottom up or you open it, you might open it from the top. Um, and it'll have counterweights and springs or spring-loaded coil tap on it. Uh, double hung will open from both directions, right? So two sashes that can move past each other on the vertical plane. Um, you'll see these a lot in, in, in residential occupancies. Um, and again, balancing devices in those situations as well. Casement, uh, it has a one side that's hinged, uh, like a one uh, has a side hinge sash that's usually installed to swing outwards. So much like a door opens, it's going to open up like a door. Those are those are casement windows. Uh, horizontal sliding, 
the name itself kind of gives it away. Uh, basically, uh, it's, it's one that's going to open by sliding horizontally. <laughs> uh, it has two or more sashes, uh, of which at least one of them is going to move horizontally within the frame. So you've got two windows there, one of them is going to move and open up. At least. A couple of different types here. Uh, so there's awning style, uh, one or more that are top hinged outward swinging sashes. Uh, this one, uh, the picture here has four. Uh, it has four uh, top hinged outward swinging sashes are, you know, uh, a lot of times you'll see it with only one in other cases, you might have an awning at the bottom and you'll have a fixed at the top, right? Uh, Jalousi is not one I see very often, but, uh, you've got a large number of narrowly over overlapping glass sections swinging outwards with that one. Uh, projecting, uh, swings outward at the top or bottom, uh, and uh, and then slides upward or downward. So not only does it swing out, it then can slide up or down. Uh, and usually what you have is a push bar to operate it. And then uh, there's pivoting and we've got pictured here, horizontal pivot and a vertical pivot. Um, and this is just one where it's going to pivot somewhere on its axis. Or axis. Um, part will swing inward and part will swing outward when it opens. All right, talk a bit about security now. Um, so windows and doors, I mean, they provide an access point for intruders. People don't want, you know, they don't want people to be accessing their house, you know, without permission. Uh, and so they install things on them to prevent that from happening. Things like metal bars, grills, or screens. Um, these can be fastened to the exterior window frame or the building itself to prevent illegal entry. Uh, metal bars may be fastened to the bu building, embedded in masonry. Uh, mounted on hinges. I mean, they are trying to make it tough for people to get in and that's that that translates over to what we do as well So it makes it harder for us to get in whether it's to make access for an interior attack or whether it's for ventilation activities It can really uh, it can really cause problems for us <clears throat> um, There are security windows available with movable sashes and fixed bars so that the windows can be open for ventilation while still maintaining security so you know, that's the kind of thing I'd want to have, certainly, you know, especially since when I cook, I smoke out the kitchen. You want to be able to open it up and still allow some air movement within your unit. But, uh, but you don't want, you know, some guy coming in the, uh, in the window in the middle of the night. So there are, there are uh, types of windows like that as well. In emergency situation, the, these bars or grills can obviously prevent, uh, can prevent the, the residents from escaping. Right, um, and it can also slow our access time. Um, we need to be able to, you know, we need to look at these kind of windows, and a lot of times think to, you know, remove or disable them to ensure that our, that we have safety. If we have people going into a building, we should certainly be taking any kind of security, uh, you know, grills or bars off of the windows, uh, because you know, given an emergency situation, a firefighter inside may look at that window as a potential, you know, lifeline and a potential egress from a very nasty situation. We want to make sure that's available to them. Okay, so we've talked a lot about construction, and now I'm going to talk just a little bit, uh, a couple of slides talk about um, contents, because this is a part of what will add to our fuel load as well. So I've added this into it. Uh, again, it doesn't really have much to do with construction, but it certainly has to do with the building that, we, that we're going to, right? Um, and there's two types of, of, of uh, contents, uh, you know, that we can that we could talk about and that's legacy versus modern. Uh, for those of you who've had, you know, who've maybe been here for a while and, and taken some of the, you know, team leader and leadership courses, uh, the ones that we, you know, were uh, strategies and tactics, things like that, you might have seen some of this before. Um, and I mean, the way that we've built houses has changed. Well, the way that we've built our furnishings and the things that go into our houses has also changed. Um, so when we talk about legacy content fires, we're talking about, you know, things from the past that, you know, the way that we used to build and primarily that was using things such as natural fiber contents, uh, you know, like woods, wools, cottons, um, these kind of fires with, in legacy, with legacy contents have a relatively low heat release rate, uh, relatively, I say, I mean, it's still going to get hot, but relatively low heat release rate. Um, when compared to the new modern construction, which is a hydrocarbon based, uh, which is made with hydrocarbon based products. 
Um, so again, modern, that's fires that involve hydrocarbon-based synthetic contents. Uh, things like foam, rubber, nylon, uh, rayon, polypropylene, um, these fires have a re relatively high heat release rate uh, when compared to the natural fiber products that we find in legacy fires. So our home contents have transitioned from being primarily the natural materials to being dominated by synthetic materials now. Hydrocarbon and synthetics such as polyurethane foam have now replaced cotton as the padding foundation in upholstered furniture. So, you know, we're now using foam and actual, you know, plastics and things like that as opposed to cotton and natural fibers. Um, and the synthetic materials carry a much significantly higher heat release rate and they, they lead to extreme fire behavior much more rapidly. And to demonstrate that, I have a little video for you here. So what we have here is on the left, we have a structure. You can see top and bottom left is the legacy fuel, top and bottom right. That is same house build, uh, filled with basically the modern fuels. So you saw the flame in the legacy fuel very quickly went up. Uh, and now we're just starting to see at about a you know, minute in, we started to see the flame in the modern fuels, right? Now let's look at the off-gassing and the thermal layering, the modern fuel very quickly. We're getting to that, that thermal layering, that thick black smoke, uh, which again, smoke is fuel. That's causing quite a bit of off-gassing. That legacy fire, look at the room, I, I can still see in it. In the modern fuel right now, I can't see anything in there anymore. If you go in and you make entry at this point, we're getting to the point of what we call vent limited. Uh, it doesn't have enough air. It has lots of fuel still in there, but it's vent. But, but we've gotten to a point now where it doesn't have enough oxygen to sustain combustion. So you still see. Look in the legacy fuel. Look at what the the room looks like in there, and where we're at with the one on the right. Now. Here we are, we show up, fire department at the modern fuel fire. We've shown up eight minutes in, we open it up, and now we get that second growth, right? Very rapidly, you're gonna suck in all of the air it can, all of the oxygen it can. So they went vent limited at five minutes. At two minutes and 15 seconds, basically, that room flashed over. We are at 12 minutes and 56 seconds, and we haven't quite gotten to flash over on the legacy fuels yet. So when you hear the beast has changed, this is a, a great example of how it's changed. The beast being the fire. The fire has changed. It's not your grandfather's fire. If you had, you know, relatives who were firefighters before, the type of fire the fires that they would have experienced uh, are not uh, like are, have lower heat release rates, and and it gave them a chance to get in there and actually do some work inside before the room flashed. How, how long does it take us as a fire department? And something we need to keep in mind, how long is it gonna take us from the time that we first, the first call go like is made by, by a reporting party to the time our truck stops its wheels at the scene? We're looking at, you know, on a good day, let's say 10 minutes, right? And depending on where you are on an average, maybe 10 minutes. And, you know, that's, by that time, that room could have flashed and gone vent limited for five minutes before you even showed up. So now we've kind of gotten, you know, the, the visibility's gone down in that legacy fuels room. Reach flash over at this point in time. So basically all the contents in that room are burning and we're into free burn, uh, the fully developed stage. Any second here, they're gonna stop the video. So with that one, ventilation limited at 20 minutes, time from ventilation uh, to flash over. So that was when we actually, so after we ventilated, the fire department came in and ventilated, took, still took another eight minutes and 30 seconds. After we got there, you know, when vent limited at five minutes, two minutes and 15 seconds after they, the fire department showed up, opened the doors, room flashed. That was fast. This is why need to be cool from the exterior we need to be uh, we need to be sucking some of that heat out so 
So that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So just to summarize, I mean, our safety when we're firefighting depends on our ability to know how that building that we're pulling up to is going to contribute. And even in some cases, you know, it might contribute to fire spread and in some cases may control the fire spread. We also need to understand the effect that fire and heat have on structural components and the different kinds of materials to be able to better anticipate the results. A lot of that's gonna come from experience, but understanding the way that these are, are built, understanding the concept of void spaces and things and, and the different materials that are used now uh, is certainly gonna prepare us better when we do show up at these fires. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording now and we can, uh, we can go with any questions you have.